Hello students, welcome to your online lecture for drugs that are going to be used to treat gastrointestinal um, pathologies. I've decided to break this lecture down into two part lecture series um, because I think it actually would be a little bit more digestible, no pun intended, um, for you all. So in the first part of the online lecture series, what we're really going to be focusing in on um, is the physiology of the stomach, um, how food actually gets digested, then we'll talk through the probably three more common generalized diseases that can plague the GI tract. The first one will be um, heartburn, uh, GERD, and then peptic ulcer disease. And then in part two, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the nuances of GI tract pathology and diseases. And we'll talk about constipation, um, diarrhea, and then we'll talk about irritable bowel syndrome and um, diseases associated with irritable bowel. Um, so welcome to part one of our online lecture series. I'm Dr. Cosby. I'm excited to really be talking about probably the number two over-the-counter drug um, or medicine that is utilized among the athletic population. The first being anti-inflammatory drugs, and then the second being um, drugs that are going to be used to, to treat most of the gastrointestinal diseases or disorders that we'll be talking about today. The good news is most of these are relatively harmless diseases and usually pass within 72 hours to two weeks. So that's the good news. So first things first, let's talk a little bit about how food kind of gets digested. Because if you understand that, then you'll understand the physiology behind um, the stomach and the protective me mechanisms that are in place for us as we kind of eat. So imagine this, or even if you wanted to maybe eat something with me. So I'll grab something and I'll eat it, right? Now, as I start to eat, a few things are happening in my mouth. The first thing is my saliva glands are producing saliva. Hence the reason I keep pausing as I'm te teaching. The second thing that happens is I'm using my teeth, particularly my molars, to grind the structure, right? Um, to break it down into small kind of digestible pieces. And so those two things happen. Saliva gets produced. I start to use my teeth to masticate, right? Now I'm going to this and I'm going to swallow it quickly so that I can finish the rest of this lecture. So as this process happens, as I start to break down the food, as maybe the saliva starts to moisten it or wetten it, um, and I think about like crackers, for example, or bread where the saliva would break down things a lot more efficiently than actually chewing or something like, you know, your steaks or your chicken, right? Um, maybe larger vegetables might not be broken down by saliva. So then they get broken down in the process of mastication, right? So we can see those two things happening. Either way, that very large maybe substance um, or solid gets broken down and moves from our mouth into the pharynx or the throat where it then is delivered to this tube-like structure known as the esophagus. And the esophagus is extremely important. It's also the process where that um, large solid structure gets more liquefied and is able to get broken down or move through the entire GI tract. So during this process, that solid gets passed from the throat into this long tube-like structure known as the esophagus. Now, interestingly enough, the esophagus is not like the stomach. The stomach has a mucosal kind of lining filled with epithelial cells to protect it from its very acidic environment. Your esophagus, on the other hand, does not have that same thick mucosal lining or protective barrier. So it's a very sensitive um, anatomical structure in the process of digestion. And, and that fact will become important as we talk through how food is actually broken down acidically in just a second. So we eat something, we chew it, saliva is released. Either we break it down through mastication or saliva. It then gets delivered through the pharynx or the throat to the esophagus, which is a tube-like structure. Major role is then to moisten that structure to break degradate it a little bit more. But really, it serves as a passageway for, for food um, from the esophagus into the actual stomach, right? Now, there is this little anatomical structure that lives right here between the esophagus and the stomach. So I'm going to move us over here to the right-hand side of the slide so that you can see something known as the lower esophageal sphincter or less for um, shorter pronunciation. The lower esophageal uh, sphincter, its major role is to stay most often very uh, constricted. So in other words, it's, it's in a closed position. And the only time that that lower esophageal sphincter really relaxes is really one fold. You're eating food, that food moves from the mouth to the throat, down the esophagus, 
And once pressure starts to sit on top of the lower esophageal sphincter, it will cause the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. And that is like the Pac-Man, you know, the pa or um, when you're playing an arcade game, what's it called? The psh pinball machine you know how you release you hold the ball back and then you release it and those two little flaps open up and you're trying to keep them closed the whole time so that the ball doesn't go through think of your lower esophageal as those little flaps right that when it's closed the ball can't go through or food can't go through and when it's open um, the food is allowed to empty into the stomach now that we can think of that naturally what we also need to understand about the lower esophageal sphincter is its major role is to prevent reflux of stomach acid or stomach contents back into the esophageal lining and here's why that's important because if our lower esophageal sphincter stays open that stomach is very acidic and so we have acid entering proximally into the esoph esophagus and remember i just told you it's not lined it's not protected and so then there's this erosive uh, process that occurs in the esophagus and we'll talk about what happens later to the esophagus if that's allowed to happen continuously um, but with that said we have food it goes through the esophagus the it sits and provides a little bit of pressure that lower esophageal sphincter opens up and then food is allowed to empty into the stomach now naturally um, as human beings just at a resting state our ph in the stomach is relatively low or another way to say it it's relatively acidic and um, that ph drops even lower and is triggered by the sight of smooth food by the smell of food for example um, it kind of triggers our gastric acids but particularly um, hydrochloric acid and gastrin kind of to kind of be released in the stomach to start the process of breaking down the contents that are getting ready to enter into the actual stomach itself so on a normal day our resting kind of pH is about a 1 to a 5 that's important to know for your board of certification examination but also then to understand that because our stomach is naturally acidic um, it makes sense that God designed us in such a beautiful way that we naturally create what we call is a mucosal kind of lining around the inside of our stomach so we have this thick kind of mucus like structure which usually cannot be penetrated in a natural setting now of course if there's a wound to the inside of the stomach for example or if we have a bacterial or a viral infection which has started to invade the mucosal lining then that acid can start to eat away at the stomach and then we just left a module where we talked about anti-inflammatory drugs and how they lead to peptic ulcer disease right and so we can see how there are ways in which the mucosal lining can be destroyed but for the most part we're created in such a way that we would naturally create a buffer to the acidic environment that naturally lives in our body so let's repeat we eat food saliva mastication moves through the mouth goes through the throat or the pharynx into the esophagus where it's humidified broken down a little bit more that lower esophageal sphincter relaxes allows food to move into the stomach and then it closes no food is allowed or acid is allowed to move back through the esophagus so it's almost like a one-way valve when food hits the stomach, we know that the stomach is somewhat acidic already, so we're kind of prepared ultimately to begin the process of breaking down um, the protein that we've eaten or the structure that we've eaten, and that's natural. And then from there, we have something, another uh, sphincter that lives between the stomach and the most proximal portion of the small intestine known as the duodenum. So this is the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is very similar to the lower esophageal sphincter in that it's constricted until food gets digested and then as it's getting ready to empty out of the stomach into the duodenum it will relax and allow the movement of food from the stomach into the duodenum and it's the duodenum where a lot of the absorption of our food actually happens so the fuel the food that we will absorb for nutrients for fuel for energy etc most of that absorption actually occurs in the duodenum so the most proximal portion of the small intestine so once the food is absorbed through the small intestine, whatever is left over um, in the duodenum, whatever's left over then will kind of move through the process of motility through the small intestine and then um, up into the large intestine. And then if in eventually what happens, it gets expelled, right? In the, in the way of either urine um, or feces, right? It really just depends on the type of food that we actually ate. And that is the process of the simplified explanation of digestion, right?
Now you all might be wondering, but like, how do we have, how does our stomach remain acidic, right? And so that's what I'm gonna talk through next. So now that you understand the process of eating, moving through the throat, the esophagus into the stomach, we said the stomach is a very acidic kind of structure. So in our body, we have what are called parietal cells. So you can see kind of an example, a large scale illustration of a parietal cell. Um, on the parietal cell, we have kind of four different types of receptors. Um, we have acetylcholine receptors, gastrin receptors, histamine receptors on the bottom. We have uh, prostaglandin receptors and all of these play a different role, but essentially it's usually the binding of gastrin and or histamine um, to their receptors on the parietal cell, which will stimulate the proton pump. And so when the proton pump gets uh, stimulated, as the name implies, it's kind of an active transport system, right? I'm using language that we've heard from previous lec lectures. This active transport system or this proton pump becomes activated by the binding of gastrin or histamine um, to their receptors on the parietal cell. This then kind of triggers a, a movement of ions across the proton pump. We have um, the hydrogen ion leaving the parietal cell and that's a positive ion. It's gonna bind to chloride, which is actually chlorine, sorry, which is actually in the stomach itself. So we move from the parietal cell into the actual stomach. And so when hy the hydrogen ion is allowed to bind to that chlor chlorine item um, ion, we get what we call as hydrochloric acid. So that's part of the reason that we have kind of this acidic environment in the stomach. And this is great because when we have an acidic environment in the stomach, we know that we're ripe and ready to kind of digest the structures that will empty into the stomach from the esophagus, right? But to maintain homeostasis so that we don't have an influx in, in the acidic environment of the stomach, what we also see happening when that proton pump is activated is yes, the pumping of hydrogen ion out of the parietal cell, but then we have um, potassium um, moving from the stomach back into the parietal cell, creating homeostasis, a net outflow of hydrogen ion, a net inflow of potassium ion. So we can see how as long as we maintain that homeostasis, we don't have an increase or a decline in the, the acid sitting in the stomach. So, so far, so good. We create hydrochloric acid. That hydrochloric acid is going to be good for two things. Number one, breaking down protein in the body. And then number two, we're going to talk about the chief cells on the next slide and um, the hydro the hydrochloric acid is extremely important for activating an, an enzyme known as pepsin. So hold that thought. On the last part or the inferior part of that parietal cell, we can see that there is another receptor. This is a receptor that uh, prostaglandins actually bind to. Remember prostaglandins kind of um, fall into the cyclooxygenase pathway, right? And prostaglandins, um, they can be good, particularly the COX-1 pathway, right? Where we have that housekeeping mechanism prostaglandin eyes kind of increase um, secretion of mucus and then your prostaglandin E2s will kind of decrease secretion of uh, hydrochloric acid. So you can see how they kind of even each other out a little bit. They play different roles, but their overall goal is to protect the gut in different ways. So all that to be said, if you look at this parietal cell, there are many ways in which the drugs that our student athletes take can work to kind of reduce the acidic environment in the stomach. If, for example, it, the, it, it gets thrown off, the homeostasis gets thrown off, right? We could take an, a, hist, a histamine antagonist, which binds here and doesn't allow histamine to bind to its receptor, thereby inhibiting the proton pump thereby inhibiting the amount of hydrochloric acid that's being produced in the stomach, which reduces the acidity in the, in, um, in the actual stomach itself, right? Um, we could have, um, take a drug that kind of fights for the attachment um, for the prostaglandins, right? And then if we do that, we have a decline in the hydrochloric acid being produced in the stomach. So there's lots of indirect ways to work through patients who have gastrointestinal issues. Last but not least, let's say we can't capture, we can't get a drug, get access to a drug that binds to a receptor, right? One other way to do it is then to um, change the acidic environment in the stomach by introducing a base, right? If we introduce a base, then the, the pH in the stomach will start to increase. So there's multiple drugs on the market that work in different ways. Your role would be just to decide which one might be best for the patient that you have sitting in front of you. So one other cell that we have to talk about 
before we move forward, we have the parietal cell, which has the three receptors, right? The acetylcholine, the gastrin, the histamine receptor. It's attached to the proton pump, right? We have um, a good in outflux of hydrogen ion moving out into the stomach. We have potassium ion moving into the parietal cell. In addition to that, we have something called a um, known as a chief cell. And the chief cell is extremely important because it houses what we call as an inactive enzyme known as pepsinogen and that inactive peptide kind of has um, a peptide bond that is in uh, that uh, binds to it that makes it inactive and so when that parietal cell um, stimulates the proton pump to release hydrogen ion to attach to the the chlorine um, chloride ion to create hydrochloride then what we tend to see is that attachment also triggers the release of that kind of inactive form of of pepsinogen and now that pepsinogen becomes an active enzyme known as pepsin and pepsin is extremely important because in addition to the acidic environment it is an enzyme that will also work to break down particularly dietary protein. So most of the food that we eat, it's gonna help come alongside those, um, the gastric acid, the stomach acid to break down the proteins, thereby making digestion even more efficient in terms of its process. Now, one of the things that we see in, this, in these last few slides that I've talked through is we have great mechanisms for producing acid, the acid needed to, per, um, to break down a lot of the proteins that we're going to eat. But because our stomach is so acidic, what are some of the protective mechanisms that we have in place to protect us from the acidic environment that the stomach tissue, those epithelial cells are going to live in, right? So that we don't have stomach degradation. So you will recall from our inflammatory uh, response lecture that we have arachidonic acid, which breaks down into COX-1 and COX-2. Our COX-1 would be our housekeeping cyclooxygenase, right? And then our COX-2 would be one that is produced in inflammatory conditions. We remember this oftentimes are generalized over the counter NSAIDs. Remember, they're going to target both COX-1 and COX-2, which means they are going to um, sometimes not allow for the processing or the synthesis of prostaglandin, right? And that leads to increase in ulcerations because let's take it deeper. Your prostaglandin E2, they're going to decrease the amount of acid that's being produced. And in fact, it's really that they reduce the amount of hydrogen ion flowing out of the parietal cell into the stomach, which means we have less hydrochloric acid being created over time. That's the prostaglandin E2, right? Your prostaglandin I2s, on the other hand, as I mentioned, they're going to increase um, mucosal secretion and kind of create this kind of sticky lining that protects against any acid that might try to eat away at the epithelial cells. So we can see that we have two protective mechanisms that will get destroyed most often if we use a non-selective, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So we can see that prostaglandin synthesis is extremely important and that we have to be careful when we have patients on NSAIDs that, um, that if they present to us with signs and symptoms of gastrointestinal pathologies that we remove that NSAID and potentially place them on a COX-2. But now you understand if we go back two slides where those NSAIDs are actually working, they're preventing PGE2 from binding to that receptor. And if they do that, then what we know is they are going to increase, right? Cause an increase in acid being released and possibly degradation of the stomach because that PGE2, if it attaches to the receptor is responsible for inhibiting the secretion of acid and maintaining kind of homeostasis in the stomach. So hopefully the two lectures are kind of tying together, I hope. So now that you have an understanding of how the stomach works, the parietal cell, the chief cells, um, and the proton pump, let's talk about disorders of the GI tract. And in this particular online lecture, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, and then we'll talk about peptic ulcer disease, and then we'll move into probably more simplistic forms of gastrointestinal disorder. So heartburn, known as indigestion, um, is going to result from having an inefficient, which one do you think? Pyloric or lower esophageal sphincter? Great. It's, it's a dysfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter. So I wanted to say that to you all to say this. What happens is, remember we eat, it comes down the esophagus, and as the food sits there, what, is this, what does the lower esophageal sphincter do?
it relaxes, right? And it allows the food to move into the stomach and then what? It constricts again, right? Preventing reflux. In a patient who is experiencing heartburn, in some way, either the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes and doesn't close completely, right? So think about those pinball legs. Here's the pinball legs if they're completely closed. But have you ever done like something like this where the ball kind of sits in the middle of the pins and doesn't sit on top, right? Think of it that way. Think of, okay, I didn't get them closed all the way, but I caught the ball so it didn't go through the pinball machine, right? This is what I'm talking about when I say an inefficient lower esophageal sphincter. So it may close a little bit, but not all the way. And so what happens is some of that acid, hydrochloric acid, gastric acid, etc., is allowed to move proximally into the esophagus. What did I say was one of the concerns about the esophagus in particular? Yes, you got it, right? What I said was is that it's not protected by a mucosal lining. There aren't any prostaglandins, um, particularly prostaglandin I2s, right? The ones that are producing mucus in the stomach to protect it. There isn't anything in there to protect it. So what happens is, is as that acid is allowed to move proximally, it starts to cause erosion of your esophagus. And that becomes that causes that kind of burning in the center of the chest that the patient um, perceives, or it might be burning in the pharynx or the throat. And that's all because those two anatomical structures are not protected like the stom stomach is. The stomach is used to being in a, an acidic environment. And so for that reason, we create protective mechanisms. The esophagus and the throat are not. And so they aren't equipped with the same protective mechanisms as our stomach. So that's where heart, how heartburn is be is created um, there are other causes for heartburn some of them include things we can do nothing about so i'll give you an example increased abdominal pressure is a common cause of heartburn that can be in obese overweight patients who carry a lot of their weight in the upper portion of the torso that weight begins to push on the diaphragm which causes again that kind of inefficient sphincter causes the the lower esophageal sphincter to stay open instead of closing completely so some of that acid is allowed to come back up in pregnant women as well especially when the fetus is head up in the abdominal cavity that head pushes up against the lower esophageal sphincter so those are examples of ways in which increase um, abdominal pressure can cause kind of um, lower esophageal reflux certain foods cause the um, sphincter to release a little bit so chocolate's going to be an example of that alcohol is going to be another example of that and then last but not least um, patients who take anti-inflammatories uh, for an extended period of time are at a higher risk for heartburn. Again, that has to do with this component right here, NSAIDs blocking PGE2 from binding to its receptor, thereby, thereby not really having control over how much hydrochloric acid is being produced. And so some of that acid might reflux into the esophagus causing the heartburn that you experience, right? Heartburn most often is very short term. And then the long-term version of heart heartburn is going to be gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. So when we think about GERD, this is something that happens two times a week for, I don't know, months at a time. So they experience heartburn multiple times a week, right? You can imagine kind of how uncomfortable that might be. And the concern with that is going to be, number one, GERD in particular heartburn has been linked to the triggering of asthma attack asthma attacks in patients who actually have been diagnosed with asthma. So you really are concerned that if you have a lower esophageal sphincter that is not under control, this patient may suffer from more asthma attacks than the normal asthmatic patient. So that's something to keep in mind. And then there's this thing called um, erosive esophagitis, which is basically where the, um, because the esophagus isn't lined with the mucus, that acid sits in the esophagus and starts to eat away at it and can poke holes in it and might actually require surgery. And then last but definitely not least, um, the same thing that I'm describing in the lower esophageal sphincter can also happen in the distal pyloric sphincter. So in this case, what happens is is um, when the food is absorbed in the duodenum, whatever is not left over is broken down into bile and into acid. And so that bile and that acid can then reflux back into the lower portion of the stomach, creating in and of itself an inflammatory condition within the stomach as well. Um, so all in all, we're still concerned regardless. Um, gastroesophageal reflux disease um, can be treated just as much as heartburn can. And we're going to talk about the different ways to kind of treat that 
over the counter. So in terms of drugs that are going to be used to treat our gastro um, reflux, esophageal reflux disease, it's going to be our H2 receptor antagonist, our proton pump inhibitors, are these ringing a bell, and our ant acids, right? So let's talk through these. When do we want to use a, a pharmacological treat for, a treatment for patients with GI pathologies? Well, patients who have um, repeated frequent episodes of some type of reflux. So complaining of chest pain or throat pain that makes them very, very uncomfortable. We want to control that, right? So patient who comes into us complaining of multiple times a week of experiencing this, we want to treat it, right? The ideal would be to treat it when it's heartburn so that it doesn't develop into GERD or erosive esophagitis, right? So that's the ultimate goal. In terms of goals for for therapy, we want to reduce the symptoms. Uh, we want to limit the frequency of the uh, reflux that's occurring. The big thing, especially in a ero erosive esophagitis or erosive um, in stomach, is that we actually want to make sure that we're also providing providing preventative measures to heal the actual gut itself and prevent the um, complications. One of the worst long-term complications associated with GERD and heartburn is actually the development of like esophageal cancer, for example. So we want to make sure that we're treating this and we're not blowing it off. So last but not least, so we've talked about um, things that would really impact the esophagus. GERD is gastroesophageal and then heartburn occurs as a result of irritation of the esophagus. Peptic ulcer disease, on the other hand, is um, a disease of the actual stomach itself. So in this case, we have um, damage to the mucosa of the actual stomach or the duodenum. So you have the most proximal portion of the small intestine, the part that's responsible for allowing us to absorb a lot of our nutrients, that becomes compromised. This is different than the other two pathologies, which were more esophageal or upper GI tract pathologies. So there are three kind of categories that it falls into. Ulcers associated with an H. pylori or a bac bacterial inf infection. That's how a peptic ulcer can occur. And we're going to break that down a little bit. Ulcers that are caused by NSAID use, which honestly 80% of patients with peptic ulcer disease at some point in time were um, NSAID users. And then ulcers caused by like some type of hyper acid secretion, right? So let's think about PGE not being able to bind to its receptor. And so their proton pump is working over time, creating hydrogen ion, hydrogen ions binding to the chlor chloride item, and we're creating hydrochloric acid over time, right? So those are the three kind of categories in which we'll lump peptic ulcer disease into. Um, but there are other causative factors. So alcohol abuse has been linked to peptic ulcer disease, particularly reflux of the pyloric sphincter of the bile and acid into the lower portion of the stomach um, is what alcohol can do. Cigarette smoking has also been uh, linked to creating a more acidic environment. Um, and so what we want to try to do is on our historical questions, on our PPEs, we want to be asking our patients, do they drink alcohol? How often do you ever wonder why your physician asks you those things on your physical exam? Well, those are the reasons what they're really trying to get at is, are you at a high risk for peptic ulcer disease? Are you um, at a high risk for like gastritis, for example? These would all be check, check marks uh, would make, would raise a red flag for a healthcare practitioner. So there are different causative factors. One common causative factor is uh, helobacter pylori, which is a normal circulating at bay bacteria in the stomach that actually has mostly protective mechanisms. However, when we have compromise to the actual stomach lining, the helicobacterial pylori can actually, as you can see, is kind of finger-like or worm-like. Its worms usually stay trapped. You can see that in between the mucus, mucosal layer and the epithelial cells of the stomach. However, when acid starts to break through both the mucus layer and the epithelial layer, that bacterial is that bacteria then is allowed to kind of attach to the stomach and create what we call as a bacterial infection. That bacterial infection will start to degradate and eat at the um, the stomach and cause a peptic ulcer disease. So H. pylori can be transmitted many ways, fecal to oral. So um, right, like. Cosby, really? But if you're a nanny, for example, it's one of the recommendations to actually wear gloves when you're changing a diaper, because even though you may not think you've got fecal matter on your hands, you might go to wipe your, your eyes or wipe your face after changing a diaper and you've just transmitted H. pylori. 
right? Can be mouth to mouth. So um, bacterial infections, kissing, for example, would be another example of that. Um, one of the great things about H. pylori, if it's held in check, is it can buffer acid. So it can act almost as a bicarbonate. But when it's allowed to become untrapped between the mucosal and the epithelial layers, that's when it can start to cause degradation to the stomach. So if held in a homeostatic environment, H. pylori can be a good thing. But if we start to see damage to the layers and we start to see a, re a release of the bacteria, it can actually be very, very, very harmful. Okay, next um, for peptic ulcer disease, we already know this. This is NSAIDs. It's number one cause of peptic ulcer diseases in patients between the ages of 18 and 25. So again, going back to this pathway without being too redundant, but letting you know it's, it's extremely important for you to understand the in the COX, the cyclooxygenase pathway, right? If we inhibit um, prostaglandin synthesis, essentially what we do is we um, reduce the body's ability to, number one, with PGI2s, create or increase mucosal protection around the actual stomach. With our PGEs, we reduce the body's ability to kind of keep the acid at bay or keep the acid in check. So we will uh, inhibit uh, we will not be able to inhibit acid secretion. That's why I want to say it, right? Which means if we reduce both of these, then we reduce our body's natural ability to repair itself, right? If our body is homeostatic, we have these natural items built in, right? The PGIs, they're going to increase secretion of mu mucus. Your PGEs, if they're allowed to bind to that receptor, they will inhibit acid secretion, right? So let's think about it this way naturally. I eat and I know that my body's going to produce acid, right? Like whether that's proton pump pumping and pushing hydrogen ion out into the stomach to create hydrochloric acid. I'm going to produce acid to break down um, the, the food that I eat, right? Naturally, what happens is, number one, when we eat, we're also going to increase or uh, the mucosal lining because we know that there's going to be an increase in acid secretion, right? But the other protective mechanism is that PGE at some point in time will say, you know what, that's enough. We don't need any more acid. The food is emptied from the stomach. Let me attach to my receptor. Let me inhibit acid secretion. So we have to have this kind of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. That's where your PGIs and your PGEs come in. So if our inset is blocking that ability, then we see that we don't have the protective mucosal lining or we don't inhibit acid secretion and so then we start to develop kind of sores on the the esophagus i'm sorry on the stomach so most common type of peptic ulcer disease we'll see if it's not h pylori right okay so what do we do for peptic ulcer disease kind of what treatments some of them are going to be the same the top three are going to be the same so h2 receptor antagonist proton pump inhibitors acid and then we're going to go with circulate and bismuth compounds and we'll talk about what those are so let's talk about our h2 receptor antagonists first think about it this way here's our parietal cell here are our receptors if we take an h2 receptor antagonist pepsid ac tagamet zantac axid ar any of those over-the-counter medications what we're saying is we're going to prevent histamine from binding to its receptor. It's going to, it's an antagonist. It means it's gonna compete for the same receptor site as histamine, right? So if we take an H2 antagonist, it's gonna block histamine's ability to bind to its receptor, which means what for the proton pump? It's gonna block the ability of the proton pump to do what? Push out as much hydrogen ion as it normally would into the stomach, which means we have less hydrochloric acid being produced, which ultimately means we have um, a a more basic environment for the stomach, right? Are we seeing that? Hopefully we are. Okay, some of the most common H2 receptor antagonists that you all might know um, are going to be Tagamint, yes, Pepsid, um, and Zantac. I mean, those two, two or three are the most commonly over-the-counter um, used H, um, H2 receptor antagonists. What they do is block the production of gastric acid by inhibiting histamine from being released. So let's go back here. They're going to inhibit histamine from binding to that receptor and indirectly by doing that, 
what do we do there? We slow down the proton pump, essentially, right? Everybody see that? We slow down the proton pump, not enough hydro hydrogen ions being moved out, and so we can't have the binding of H to Cl, and so we don't have the production of hydrochloric acid. Now, of course, if if you're asking me, oh, Dr. Kasu, what do I need to know? You need to know that that um, on a multiple choice question, which of these is an H2 receptor antagonist? And so you should be able to say tagament, pepsid, and Zantac. Those are the top three, right? Now, in terms of dosing, do you need to know that? No. The reality is one of the things that I want you to see is that dosing goes up um, based on the severity. Heartburn is the least severe of the three pathologies that we just talked about. GERD is somewhere in the middle and peptic ulcer because that's actually impacting the stomach is the most severe. So what you can see over time is, you know, for heartburn signs and symptoms, you take a lower dose, right, of that H2 receptor antagonist. For your peptic ulcer, you're probably going to be taking a higher, a higher dose, um, right? Everybody see that? Okay. Awesome. Okay. One of the things about H2 receptor antagonists also is it has a quicker onset of action. So if we want to uh, reduce acute signs and symptoms, an H2 receptor antagonist is going to be a better drug to use than maybe a proton pump inhibitor, which has a longer onset of action. Um, but with a quicker onset of action, we also know what about it? It has a shorter half-life, which means we're going to have, may have to take it a little bit more than the other drugs that we're actually going to talk about. So here are some of the medications, that Tagamint, that Pepsid, that Zantac, need to at least know that, okay? So what are the, some of the common side effects associated with um, peptic ulcer disease with GERD and with heartburn. Name them. You got it. Um, chest pain, burning sensation, right? Might even have stomach pain if it's a peptic ulcer disease in the area of the stomach, right? Um, and big key side effects associated with H2 receptor antagonists, nausea and diarrhea, right? Very rare, but those are the most common adverse side effects. All right, the next category of drug or, drugs are gonna be your proton pump inhibitors. As the name implies, if you take a proton pump inhibitor, it's going to act directly on the proton pump, right? So histamine or gastrin or acetylcholine can still bind to the receptors, right? They're gonna trigger the proton pump to start pumping, but the proton pump inhibitor is gonna block the proton pump from moving hydrogen ions into the actual stomach. Uh, most common proton pump inhibitors are going to be Prilosec, Prevacid, and Nexium. And so let's talk through this just a little bit. Your proton pump inhibitors, they're gonna inhibit gastric secretion by blocking the proton pump um, itself. So it's going to prevent that kind of active transport system from moving hydrogen ion into the actual stomach. The great thing about proton pump inhibitors is that they have a longer duration of active, um, of action um, and are most often, at least for long-term treatment, are more effective at relieving signs and symptoms than your H2 antagonists. Again, your H2 antagonists you're gonna use acutely, right? Like we wanna just reduce, reduce the signs and symptoms right away. Your proton pump inhibitors more than likely are gonna be used long-term to kind of alleviate, long, alleviate long-term um, signs and symptoms. So some of the most common types of proton pump inhibitors that we see, the Nexium, the Prevacid, and probably the Prilosec, what you can see in terms of um, peptic ulcer versus GERD, you can see that with your peptic ulcer, the doses tend to be a little tiny bit higher, maybe one to two times higher than those that are going to be used to treat to treat GERD. And then if you have GERD with GERD, gastroesophageal um, reflux disease associated with an erosive kind of wearing away of the esophagus, then the doses tend to be a little bit higher to protect and increase the mucosal the mucosal layer, okay? So what do you need to know for proton pump inhibitors? You need to know, um, if I go back, where they act. And then you also um, truly do need to know at least three different types of proton pumps inhibitors by their name. So the three that we've seen most often come up on the exam, Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosec. Those are the most common um, proton pump inhibitors. Now, even though they have a longer duration of action, guess what? They're gonna have a slower onset of action. So they might take anywhere from an hour to two hours to have an onset of action. So that's something to kind of kind of consider.
In terms of common side effects, none of these are, are, are large enough to warrant you to not recommend that someone take them, but a patient who takes a proton pump inhibitor might suffer from nause, nauseousness, diarrhea, and again, similar to your um, histamine antagonist. Your antacids, by far the most common over-the-counter drug that would be used if we were looking at that parietal cell, it's at the end of the parietal cell. So we're not blocking the receptor, we're not blocking the proton pump, we're just trying to change the acidic environment to a more basic environment. So most commonly used in acid is by far going to be Tums or Alka-Seltzer Alka for example. So your antacids neutralize the stomach acid by buffering it and then they increase the stomach's pH, right? Making it more, more basic. But they have zero effect on acid production, unlike your proton pump inhibitors or your H2 antagonists, which can absolutely impact acid production, right? The great thing about most antacids is their rapid onset, probably like we're talking 10 to 15 minutes, so even better than the H2 antagonist, but again, short duration. And one of the drawbacks to antacid um, is the, really the taste. So like they're really chalky and kind of milky. And we have seen a link between antacid use and um, the development of mild, mild constipation, which will be uh, lecture two in just a second. But here are the most common types of antacid. So I'm not gonna list them all, but Alka-Seltzer would be one of the most number one over-the-counter antacids to use. Your Maalox, it can be oral or tablet strength. Um, and your Mylanta, right? Um, so we have lots of different types of antacids that are available. Just knowing, um, as I think through the three categories, so H2 antagonists, your proton pump inhibitors, and your antacids, the question that I always ask myself when I'm trying to alleviate symptoms in a patient who presents to me with GI sign symptoms is how quickly do I want the drug to take effect, right? If I want some to treat a patient long-term, then the proton pump inhibitors are going to be better because they have a longer duration of action. So oftentimes what we see in this type of drug category is the mixing of drugs, right? We might start with an acid or an H2 antagonist to reduce signs and symptoms, but for the long haul, we might give the patient a proton pump inhibitor. So you can actually kind of work together with all three categories to create or reduce sign symptoms in your patients. So here are some of the types of antacid medications. These are probably the most commonly tested on the board of certification examination. So knowing kind of the names of them will be helpful. Okay, your caraphate or your circulate, um, this is only pres prescription only. So you would actually need a prescription. So this isn't something that we as athletic trainers um, or healthcare practitioners can actually administer to a patient. But um, one of the interesting things about the caraphate drugs is they are like really pasty. Um, and what it does is, is the patient drinks the paste. The paste moves obviously through the mouth, pharynx, into the esophagus, and is either going to, depending on where the ulcer crater is, will start to kind of fill in the crater and create a healing environment. It's so neat to see. So it forms this protective barrier in the area of the crater, whether that's in the esophagus or in the actual stomach. Um, will It will bind to that damaged muc mucosa um, and maintains the barrier for up to six hours, which is enough to kind of start the healing process. So all of this to say, what other great things happen here? Um, what we typically will see is there's less side effects associated with this. It's really the patient's ability to kind of tolerate it. The nice thing is, is it, it um, plugs up area of exposures. We know that we, our stomach is naturally acidic. So it creates a lot of time for the either esophagus or the stomach to kind of heal itself. The other neat thing that we see is that it inhibits pepsin. Remember, pepsinogen is the inactive enzyme and the inactive enzyme gets gets um changed into the active enzyme pepsin when high when we have an increase in hydrochloric acid right so this is an indirect way to reduce pepsin um, pepsin increases the acidic environment in the stomach but the hard part about reducing pepsin is it slows down the breakdown of a lot of the proteins that we might eat so it's the gift and the curse in some regards it binds to, to bile acid. So in other words, bile will not be able to move from the duodenum into the stomach, right? Remember if we're allowed, if that happens, it can create, it can start to destroy or damage 
the mucosal lining, the epithelial cells, and create the peptic ulcer. And so it binds and then forces the bile out of the body in the form of feces, right? So it'll bind to it and then move it out quickly. And then the other great thing about the caraphates is that they stimulate the production of prostaglandin E's and I's, right? And we already know what the I's and the E's do. The I's are going to increase production of mucus. Those E's are going to reduce um, the, the making of hydrochloric acid. And so those are all great things about the caraphate. So what are some of the recommendations for dosing? Um, you'll take it at least one hour before a meal, right? That'll give it time to kind of coat the actual lining or the injured areas um, so that more when more acid is produced it can't keep diving deeper into those wounded areas and the duration of action is about six hours so that patient is covered through the process of digestion right um, most often if it is prescribed then it will pre be prescribed for about four to eight weeks at which point in time usually the patient will have complete healing so this is going to treat the injury but the reality is we probably have to do some dietary training with our patients as well right y'all are you seeing that Okay, one other um, type of drug is the mesoprostol or the cytotech. Um, cytotech is kind of a synthetic derivative of prostaglandin. So again, we're looking at another way to kind of improve prostaglandin synthesis. Um, this is good for NSAID users, particularly um, peptic ulcers that are caused by NSAIDs because we know that NSAIDs kind of inhibit prostaglandin production. So this is actually going to create a synthetic derivative, one that NSAIDs cannot break down. And so you can imagine what that does, right? It's going to add back the protective portion of our prostaglandins, um, particularly uh, those that are inhibited by by co the COX-1 enzyme being inhibited as well. So that's going to be allow us to increase mucosal lining production, even in some ways inhibit acid secretion so that we can allow the body to heal itself, right? Again, another prescription drug, but certainly one that would be very beneficial for a patient who's had long-term signs and symptoms and over-the-counter drugs are not working. And then this is a very potent drug. So if you can see the dosage is 400 to 800 what do you think? MCGs, not milligrams. We're calling micrograms per day with food. So you don't need a whole bunch for this drug to be effective. Because it's more per potent, we do have more side effects associated with it. Number one being diarrhea and nauseousness and in some instances, abdominal crap, cramps. Now, here's the only concern that I have. Most of us may think we will never work with a pregnant patient. The reality is I've had a few um, in my lifetime as an athletic trainer. So you may. So if a patient who has maybe um, the gastric esophageal reflux disease because of pregnancy, which may cause um, maybe heartburn, right, for example, this would be the wrong drug to give them because it can induce uterine contractions um, and can cause a, a woman to go into labor sooner than they would expect. So here's bis the bismuth compounds. Um, you all know this as Pepto-Bismol, right? Um, unfortunately, the exact mechanism in which Pepto-Bismol works is um, uncertain, but here are a few theories. I like to equate them to kind of that thick coating that we drink that goes into the craters and starts to kind of plug those craters. So almost a gastroprotective effect. Um, in addition to that, it has been linked to kind of stimulating um, the endogenous prostaglandins that may have been inhibited by the use of NSAIDs. And then one of the other things that it has is an antibacterial effect. So it actually suppresses um, H. pylori infected infection. So those peptic ulcer diseases, um, disorders that are caused by the H. pylori infection, it has been linked to improvements in those particular patients. And so you certainly can do over the counter. And then there's obviously a stronger dose, which can be given at prescription strength. One thing to note, and I found this out clinically, and I had no idea is that one of the compounds in Pepto-Bismol, especially if they're taking the tablets form, um, when you chew it, will sometimes turn the back of the tongue black. So you want to make sure that you just educate your patients on that so that they don't panic when they take um, the tablet form of the Pepto-Bismol. Um, so that concludes all of the drug categories that we would use to treat someone with either heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and or peptic ulcer disease. I hope you've learned a lot and I hope that you understand
that most of these categories and the categories we're getting ready to talk about sometimes have to do with dietary management. And you'll get into that in, in nutrition. What, what things can we do to adjust diet? Um, and a lot of these can be also um, co uh, covered, uh, for lack of better words, or treated with over-the-counter medications. It just becomes you understanding, do we want a shorter acting uh, medication? Do we want a longer acting medication? What What's the goal of the therapy for this particular patient? Hope you've learned a lot. See you in the next lecture.